get ready for a roller coaster. So I had this ex once. I was young and dumb, only just 20. He was five years older, married, had a kid. He was unhappy, a stifled artist, or so I thought. His wife was nuts, had stalked him when they first started dating, poked holes in their condoms then told him about it, and said he had to marry her or she would terminate it, something he was vehemently opposed to. Little did I know how perfect they truly were together. So we start flirting, calling each night, talking through until morning, and at this point we're just friends, but I'm falling. Eventually we confess our feelings, the whole shebang, and then one night wind up at a party with our mutual friends and take a walk around the block. We ended up hooking up on the bleachers of the nearby high school and then had to hide while we heard all of our friends come looking for us. Daring and exciting, yes, this stuff was intoxicating, I'm not proud. Eventually his wife figures out what we have going on, starts stalking me online in the MySpace era, and I have to change URLs a couple of times to shake her. He signed up to be a corrections officer since he couldn't get into the FBI, his dream job, and gets in. This is the first red flag I miss because, again, I was dumb. He comes over to mine and proudly tells me not only did he pass the psychological exam, but it was easy to cheat on. Cheat. I repeat, cheat on. He goes across state then to train for two months. I nearly break up with him. He begs me not to, then he nearly breaks up with me and I beg him no. On and on like this until finally he's able to come home. In this time, his wife gains access to his bank account and keeps draining it each month. She also comes by my work with their daughter in order to intimidate me. After making sure it got back to me that she planned on kidnapping me, beating me, and leaving me on the roadside in the state south of us. So, that was a thing. But finally he comes home. His wife kicked him out, or so he said to me, and he doesn't have money for a hotel. So I asked my parents if he could stay with us, and they agree. He lives in my home, uses the washer, eats our food, and pays for absolutely nothing. In this time he also begins divorcing his wife. His lawyer is a functioning drunk and takes what little money he managed to keep before his wife gets into his account each week. She's taken about over $18,000 at this point. So now he's staying in my house for two weeks, then back across state for two weeks working doubles. It's when he's living in my family home I finally get to see his true colors. We've been dating two and a half years at this point. His daughter is about three. His mom and I are close and I do shopping for her once in a while because she's sick and live near me. But when he's home, he is just off. He says things, does things that keep setting off flags. Then I get trichomoniasis. If you're AFOB and you've had trick, you know it's literally a living torture inside your body. If not, be glad and do your darndest to avoid it. Around this time, my ankles are swelling on and off, and I go to get everything checked out and got a pregnancy test. No results on the test. Doctor just doesn't tell me anything, but shoves me out the door and tells me my boyfriend is cheating on me. I can't believe it. I mean, why would he? We do it all the time. I was dumb. So the trike lets up, he's away at work, and life seemingly goes back to normal. Two weeks later, he's back home. The trike pops back up, he gave it to me again, and so I'm back there to the doctors for more treatment and another pregnancy test. I asked the doctor this time, so uh, are you going to tell me my results? She was very dismissive and goes, uh, yeah, you're pregnant. Turns out I was the last time too, but now it's too late to take the pill. It wasn't, she only just told me that turns out. I slept out in a daze, telling him idly as he's waiting there for me and he's just thrilled. I wanted to die. So we get home and I tell him I don't want to have the baby. I'm 23 at this point, younger than my mom was when she had me and I'm the oldest. I didn't have a job anymore because his wife stalked me into being too scared to leave the house and I just wasn't ready. He tells me, listen, termination isn't an option, you have to have my baby. This is where the really crazy stuff starts. 
He tells me he always imagined, growing up in the church, that he would be the one to father the one meant to kill the Antichrist. That his children would be kings, that he would be made a saint, etc. Me, an atheist, look at him like he just grew three heads. I tell him I cannot give a child up for adoption. Too many of my friends lived in or had siblings that had been in the system, let alone know something I grew and loved was out there without me. Then the answer's simple. We'll keep it, he tells me. So I tell him, then the two weeks you're home, you change all the diapers, since I'll be doing it when you're gone. He laughs and tells me, <laughs> that's a woman's job. I wanted to terminate it immediately. The next day he gets home from divorce court and he's painting and laughing and pacing. Asks if anyone's home, they weren't, then proclaims, I chickened out. Chickened out? He then pulls from his big bag a shiv, stabbing device fashioned from something else used in prisons as weapons, and he says, I learned this from the guys at work. To which I ask, the other COs? And he replies, no, the inmates. He worked at a supermax facility, literally the worst of the worst our state had to offer, and he had made friends with actual serial killers. I wanted to run, but was trapped in my own home for another two days with a man who had literally planned to kill his wife in the middle of court. I broke up with him that night, but bent and promised that he could still stay with my family until he had money. Two weeks go by. He leaves. I'm stricken unbelievably ill and I'm spotting. I decide with my mom to actually go through with the termination and I make the appointment. I have to wait two more weeks because of the law. I've got three days to recover before he comes home and can assume anything other than I just lost the baby. We go. Mom walks with me. They do a psych exam. The shrink tells me I'm beyond prepared for this and that I am making the right decision based on my various reasons, primarily not wanting anything to tie me to the psycho I'd just broken up with. I'm done. I'm home. I'm snarky on the volume they gave me and I sleep better than I have in all my life. The next morning everyone is at work. I'm alone and he comes back two days early. He tries kissing me, begging me, telling me how much he loves me and misses me and how much I've broken his heart. Begs me to sleep with him. I tell him over and over again, no, until all I remember is lying face down on the couch, my pants pulled down, him on top of me while I'm crying uncontrollably. He asks me what was wrong. I tell him that he just had his way with me and what he just did to me, and he just sits there trying to convince me that he didn't and couldn't understand why I was crying. I started locking myself in my room after that. So... When I went through with it with the baby, it turned out that the fetus had died at six weeks and I was 15 weeks along, so for nine weeks it was just rotting inside me. Despite the intrusive and violating internal sonogram they legally had to give me, I did manage to get a refund on that because they then classified it as an assisted miscarriage. That said, I needed a lot of help to recover from the hormones and other near lethal chemicals in my body, so... Another doctor prescribed me medication for a disorder I didn't have, medication that made things even worse. The medication I was on at the time made me manic for upwards of 48 to 72 hours, then I would crash and be dead asleep for 24 to 30 hours. On one of these occasions I woke up with my ex's hand and my, let's just say, he left with one less tooth after I kicked him off of me. I kept a chair wedged against my doorknob after that. The entire time my family was unaware, he was a corrections officer and I knew enough true crime and statistics even though to know nothing would happen if I reported him. So I lived in constant fear and anxiety, wondering what would happen next. Once on another medication, I nearly died so I stopped taking anything, despite my family trying to convince me the medications were helping. My blood sugar was the cause of what nearly killed me with the medication my family is trying to push on me, so... I literally felt like I could not trust telling the truth to anyone. Then, another night, I had traded spots with my ex so he could sleep a little in the room and I could spend time with my family, who kept telling me I was being mean to him and should just get back together with him because he loved me. I remained silent and went back to my room the second I was done eating. Only I walk into my room, switch on the light, and my ex is sprawled in my bed, 
All of my dirty underwear he'd fished out of my hamper, scattered across my bed and wrapped around his face, tissues surrounding him. I cried all night that night and was inconsolable the rest of the time he was there. He started partying with my friends then, going out drinking and then coming home at 3 and 4 a.m., ringing the bell to be let in, waking the entire house, and causing my parents to constantly scold me for his irresponsibility. Then my brother's sweet 16 came around and we had a huge party for him and my friend's brother as they were three days apart. The boys got drunk. I sat by the basement stairs so I could escape while my ex sat in the corner texting me. At one point, he asked if his new girlfriend could come to the party and that's when I finally snapped. I collected all his things, threw them outside and waited until he stepped out with my friend to chat while my friend smoked and locked him out of the house. Another friend of mine stupidly let him back in, unaware of what was happening, and I instinctively did the stupid horror movie thing and ran upstairs away from him. He chased after me, cornered me in my doorway, and was about to hit me when my older brother, army trained, stepped between us. My father came out of his room and demanded to know what happened. My ex started talking, but my brother interrupted and told my dad my ex had just tried to hit me. So my dad kicked his butt to the curb for good that night. Now, you may think this is the end of the story. You're dead wrong. This was just the first hill of our roller coaster. So strap in tighter, it gets bumpy after this. So, this was all around 2006. That following year, I'm at a little geek club that meets once a month. A couple friends are with me, and then there sat across from me as my ex. But he's not alone. He's with a woman 10 years my senior who had previously been obsessed with me and wanted to be me. She was so obsessed with being me she started dating him and he, wanting to get under my skin, wanted to make me jealous by being with someone I openly hated but only managed to test my upchuck reflex. That was the day I told everyone what had happened and that he was dangerous. I stopped going to that club and never saw many of the friends there ever again for fear that they would tell my ex about me. Skip ahead about a month or so and he has his new girlfriend the creepy old lady I hate, calling my phone from restricted numbers, leaving voicemails on my phone that they were going to murder me and to stop telling lies or I would disappear. I didn't leave my house. I stopped showering so my parents wouldn't be able to drag me anywhere. I stopped living because I was so scared. Then the car showed up. About a year after I'd broken up with him, a car kept appearing every night under my neighbor's street light. We couldn't see who was in it, Anytime we walked toward to see, it would take off. No one ever left the car. We saw someone eating in it off the dash. Rain and snow, it was always out there, all hours of the night. And finally, we realized why. I smoke, have since I was about 17 and still do. It's a habit I can't break no matter how much I've tried. And despite this next event, I couldn't quit even to save my life. One night around January at 3 a.m., I was on the phone to my friend in Indiana. I had her tied to my head with my winter hat. It was snowing and I went out for a smoke. I stood by the brick wall beside our front door, lit my cigarette and noticed a car creep onto my street. I lived two houses in from the corner on a curve. I make mention of the car to my friend, then moved to the chair my father had set behind our large shrub because despite the snow, it was clear and dry. There was a foot of snow on top of the shrub and our gas lamp set in the middle of our lawn and were it not for these two things this night, I would not be typing this right now. The car creeped in front of my house as I gave commentary of it to my friend in a hushed tone. Then as I said it had better not, the car came to a stop right at the end of my driveway. I hushed my friend a moment and she laughed, then came the bang. I heard it and a moment later felt the force of it hit my chest. He had fired his service revolver into the air when he could no longer spot me. I was silent as my friend, familiar with gunshots, screamed over the phone to find out what happened. If she had just witnessed my murder as I listened to him open his car door, pick up the shell from the freshly fallen snow, and close the door before peeling off down the street. I woke my parents, we called the cops, 
They told us they could literally do nothing and any restraining order would only make it worse and that despite him living literally across the street, illegally from the police station, they could not remove his gun from his possession because it was a service weapon issued to him by the state and mandatory for his job. I lived in constant fear and paranoia for the next year. Then the calls start coming from this crazy person that he dated after me, begging me to speak in court against him because he had done terrible things to her, strangled her, and much worse. Three other women were going to testify, she told me. Ones he had put into the ICU twice that had been friends of the friends of mine he'd partied with. I declined. I couldn't handle it emotionally. I also didn't want to give him any more reason to come after me and try to finish what he'd recently bungled. It took me traveling across the country to see friends I'd made online in a community that had helped me through all of this to finally stop being scared and start recovering. A few years later, I moved across country with my friend from Indiana. We lived out there for a bit before I wound up back home, and less than a year later, I met my ex-husband. It was winter, about 2013 or 14, when I got the most random call from my old friend, Tom. Our friend had died after a long fight with mounting illnesses. He understood what I hadn't come, why all the people there would only serve to upset me, they being the mutual friends of my psycho ex. Tom knew what had happened, was the only one who would believe me and has always been there for me, before and since. So after telling me about the service for our friend, he tells me, I have some news though. I'm not sure you want to hear. I prepare myself and ask and he tells me. It turns out our former friend who staunchly took my ex's side and called me and every woman he came into near deadly contact with a liar had some news for the group after the service. While they sat after eating supper, he informed everyone my ex was in federal prison. He had just been sentenced after about six months investigation and trial and would be serving 14 years. His crime? He had answered a Craigslist ad requesting a man to turn out a woman's 12-year-old daughter, the woman being an FBI agent and the daughter not actually existing. They had him when he requested photographs of the girl, requesting certain images of this minor, but he went a step further, as he was apt to do, and crossed state lines when pictures weren't sent. Thinking the girl lived in Florida, he drove down there to be with her, and they caught him using his credit card at Disney World buying a tangled dress for the girl to wear while he had his way. I wept tears of joy that night. He has exhausted all possible appeals and been denied each time within the first year or two of his sentence. He still has half his sentence to serve and has been serving the entirety of it in solitary confinement due to his former profession and him now just being convicted for what he just did. My family still lives in that same house, as have I since my divorce in recent years, but hopefully within the next seven years they will be moved away and safe so when he gets out he won't seek out further retaliation against me. He has been said to have openly many times proclaimed I was the reason why his life fell apart, not taking ownership for his own choices or actions, only getting progressively worse and more violent over the years. It still boggles my mind that anyone could be obsessed with me. I'm just some fat kid from the Rust Belt, poor and ugly, but then looking for logic amid insanity is a losing battle. In 2007, when I myself was seven years old, my single mom began dating a man who lived in a campground and she, my older brother, about 12 at the time, and I moved in with him. While most campgrounds are seasonal and not intended for residential use, this particular campground had a large area up front dedicated to campers and a row of trailers in the background that people lived in full time. Most of the trailers were occupied by elderly folks who wanted a cheap place to live that was close to nature, and there was only one other family there with kids my age. It was lonely during the off-seasons when no families came to camp, but during the summer, numerous families would stay there giving me the opportunity to make new friends and, in some cases, reunite with families that would visit on a yearly basis. Summers in my campground were lots of fun for a kid my age. 
There was a large pool in the center of the campground, a pavilion that would host parties practically every night, and plenty of new people coming in and out as the summer progressed. However, this influx of strangers made my mom wary, and she always stressed to me that not all grown-ups were nice, especially given how many were intoxicated during their vacation. Thankfully, I never really encountered anyone truly malicious in the seven years I lived there. A few oddballs and more drunks than I could count, of course, but most people were either nice or simply kept to themselves. However, one summer, about a year or two after we had begun living there, a rumor had begun to spread amongst the kids in the campground. I was told that there was an elderly couple visiting that summer that had been caught in a number of times staring into people's windows, following them at night, and even supposedly intentionally walking in on people as they used the public showers. I didn't take this warning very seriously since scary stories told between kids were the norm in a place like that, and I personally hadn't encountered any creepy old people. I suppose word of this got to my mom because she reminded me to always close my blinds at night just in case. Since she began to take it seriously, so did I, until the nights became unbearably hot and I began keeping my window and blinds open at night in order to let cooler air into my room. I had gone days without any strange encounters, so I figured the rumors were simply rumors, and continued to leave my windows open at night. One night, I was playing in bed with my Nintendo DS and watching old Disney Channel sitcoms at around 1 in the morning or so when I started to hear rustling outside. This wasn't particularly unusual since we had outside cats who liked to play in the leaves, and it wasn't uncommon for deer, raccoons, coyotes, and other wild animals to pass through our yard, entering and exiting the woods behind the line of trailers. When you live in the country, the nights can be just as lively as the days due to wildlife. However, the rustling seemed to be much louder than I was accustomed to. Whatever was making the noise wasn't nearly as light of foot as a typical animal. My bed was directly in front of the window, so I would have to turn my body completely around to look outside, and I was simply too tired to do so, even if it meant catching a glimpse of an elusive coyote. After a while, the noises stopped, so they completely faded from my mind as I continued to play my game. About 15 minutes later or so, I heard an incredibly strange noise, however. It sounded like a fingernail scratching against the mesh of my window. I immediately started to feel anxious. The cats couldn't reach my window, and no wild animal would care to come that close to a bright window. Instinctively, I turned around to see what made the noise. Right outside my window was an elderly man, wide eyes and big, toothless grin, face practically pressed against my window. His expression wasn't at all what I would have expected. He looked so genuinely happy to see me as if he had been waiting all that time for me to turn around and notice him. Instead of screaming for my mom or brother, I froze up, just staring at this face in my window for what felt like minutes, but was probably more like seconds, before I grabbed the blinds and rod and rapidly twisted, closing my blinds and throwing my blankets over my head. I remember trying to take shallow breaths, as though I were afraid he would hear me despite having already seen me. I tried to convince myself it was just a hallucination, or maybe even my own reflection distorted, but I knew that what I saw was real. It was inches away from me, separated only by a thin mesh screen. At some point, I must have fallen asleep because as soon as I woke up, I rushed to tell my mom what had happened. She immediately called the campground's owners, pretty close friends of ours, and they informed us that the old man along with his wife had already been kicked out. Apparently, after I closed my blinds and shut him out, the old man went to another trailer with an open window, one belonging to one of my neighbors who was also still awake. She called the campground owners who immediately called the cops, and they evicted him, along with his wife, who was apparently making her rounds peering into the windows of the campers up front. They had been doing this for over a week and finally had been caught. To this day, I'm not really sure what their motives were. It could have been a source of perverse pleasure to them, or it could have simply been an exciting hobby of theirs, seeing how long that they could stare at people before they noticed. Regardless, this event shook me quite a bit, and it was a long time before I was comfortable enough to have my blinds open whatsoever. I was more than willing to suffocate in the summer heat if it meant not risking being spied on again. 
I lived in that campground for seven years, and my childhood was certainly interesting due to it. I mean, what kid doesn't want to live in a place that's a 24-7 vacation? But the voyeuristic couple who came to visit me in the summer of 2008 definitely changed my perspective. I'm a young female living in a big city in the United States. I don't make a lot of money, so I live in a poorer area of the city. One day after work, I decided to stop by Walgreens to pick up some junk food for a movie night with my boyfriend. I rely on public transportation to get around and often travel alone, so I am not afraid of walking by myself at night. For the most part, I felt pretty safe in the city until I had this experience. It was around 11pm when I walked to Walgreens, and as I was looking in the freezer section for some ice cream, I noticed a guy lingering around me. I didn't think too much of him other than he must be buying some ice cream too and that's why he's lingering. I grabbed my ice cream and some chips and headed to the checkout area. As I was walking down the aisle, I made my eye contact with the guy and he gave me a creepy stare. I say creepy because his eyes were huge, like he had just done cocaine or some other type of stimulant. I was taken aback by his stare and picked up my pace to the cashier. I paid for my stuff and went outside to the red box, which was in front of the Walgreens, to pick out a movie. As I was browsing for a movie, I heard someone honking loudly, as if to get my attention. I turned around to see who the heck was honking, and I saw that creepy guy sitting in a white truck just staring at me. I was so sketched out that I didn't pick a movie and just started walking in the direction of my apartment complex. The quickest way back was through the back parking lot of a closed burger joint, it was dark and no one else was around, so I quickly hurried toward my home. Unfortunately, the creepy guy started to follow me in his truck. My heart started racing as he got closer. He stopped his truck in front of me, blocking my path. I was shocked by the brazenness. I tried my best not to panic or show fear, but I was basically a deer in headlights, frozen in place. He rolled his window down and smiled at me, looked me up and down. I clutched my cell phone, waiting for him to say something. He asked, Do you want a ride? His words sent ice through my veins. Was this dude about to abduct me? Is he having a manic episode, drugged out and looking for someone to prey on? Thoughts raced through my mind, but I was still frozen. I managed to say no in a hushed voice, and then he drove off, almost speeding away. I fast walked to my apartment, afraid he would turn his truck around and follow me home. I was scared to go to the Walgreens alone for a year after that incident and would make my boyfriend walk with me. I was ashamed that I put myself in that situation in the first place. As soon as I noticed that creep checking me out in the store and honking at me in the parking lot, I should have went back into Walgreens and waited for him to leave. I was lucky he didn't try to force me into his truck because no one would have been around to help me. Stay safe out there and remain vigilant of your surroundings. You never know what kind of creeps are walking around at night. I go to a university in the UK and live in the on-campus accommodation. There is a guy that lives in the flat next to my block and we'll call him Kevin. Kevin used to be on my course, but was very rude to the lecturers and students. Nothing offensive, just rude, but for example, he would often start arguing with the lecturers about the topics they were teaching. I won't say what course I do, but the point is the topics aren't exactly controversial, nor did the lecturers explain them in a very controversial way. Sometimes he would just put his hand up as if he was going to ask a question, and just repeat what the lecturer had said back to them, but as if it was a question. Usually the lecturer would just confirm that he was right and go on with the lesson, albeit noticeably annoying at the meaningless interruption. Well, Kevin stopped coming to lectures and I later found out that there was an undisclosed incident and he no longer is on the course. But that's not where it ends. I noticed he would still go outside to smoke, meaning he still lived on campus. A note about Kevin, he is an average size and built white male. He's a mature student, I'd say, probably around early 40s, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is unusual for someone that age to live on the campus accommodation. But again, nothing wrong with it, just slightly unusual. 
He also had spiked black hair that isn't styled. It looks like he was trying to have a spiky mohawk, but he has too much hair all over his head, and it's clear that the hair just isn't cut to be styled that way. And this gives him the effect of looking more like a bird or something rather than someone with a hairstyle. Now back to the story, I also heard that people who lived in the same flat as Kevin were really scared of him. The reason being is that he would bark loudly in his room, which was apparently for his mixtape, he said. This is apparently so jarring to them that campus security was called and he argued with them so much that the police were called and he argued with them too. I don't know if he was arrested or charged with anything, nor can I confirm the part is true. It may well have just been a rumor, but given what I'm about to tell you, I can easily believe it. Anyway, my class would often talk about where Kevin went, and one day we found that he used to be homeless. We knew this because one day he was in the library and typing an email when he got up to go somewhere. Someone from class caught a glance at the email. It basically detailed that he needed more money or something and that he has nowhere to go because he used to be homeless. At this point, we all kind of felt bad for the guy, and it's this information that led me to not call the campus security earlier. Well, some time passes and Kevin still smokes outside. I got to chatting with one of the cleaners in my block once and it turns out she and some other cleaners are scared of him because when they would come into his room and clean it, he would ask them all sorts of weird questions in a vaguely aggressive way, like asking where their accent is from and acting strange when they gave an answer. It's at this point that I should also mention that Kevin has poor social skills he kind of stares at people in the eye for too long and his mannerisms are aggressive which, given his rudeness and slight disheveled appearance, makes him very intimidating. Well anyway, in my block there's a long outdoor hallway and me and my friend who lives on the other end of the hallway both had noticed that at nighttime we could hear someone shouting aggressively but none of us could ever make out any real words. It also sounded like there were two people doing it so the only thing we could imagine was that two men were arguing every night. It wasn't very likely, but it was our best guess. We'll cut to about a month ago and it turns out it was Kevin. Just Kevin. I know this because when coming home one night I heard the noise and recorded it. It sounded terrifying. Like multiple people coming from one voice. I have since seen through my window that it's definitely him just saying nonsense words and shouting them. I'll post the video after this. So if that wasn't creepy enough, today I woke up and was making breakfast... Kevin was outside smoking and I was just looking outside. I'm on the ground floor and he yelled, You alright? I didn't reply, just nodded my head a little. I guess he didn't see me because he then yelled, Is there a problem? I looked at him confused, wondering if this guy was serious. He walked over to my window and started yelling, asking if I had a problem. I eventually replied that I don't and when he asked why I was staring, I told him it's my window and I can look out, all I wanted. He persisted and kept asking if there's a problem and if I wanted to come outside. Needless to say, I was shocked that this guy was really trying to fight me at 8 in the morning while I'm trying to make toast. Fed up with the situation, I told him I was calling security. This is where things got really annoying. I called security and they basically told me that they know all about him and they tried to assure me that he's not a threat. Well, that's nonsense. He's a 40-year-old man who's asking me to come outside and sort out a problem at 8 in the morning. How on earth is that not threatening enough? It's beyond me. Anyway, they did go and knock on his door, but he didn't answer, so they left. This annoyed me even more because if the rules were reversed, I'd probably be expelled for doing something like that, as would pretty much anyone. Then security came to me and told me the same thing that they were doing, background stuff to deal with him and that I'm not in danger and to just ignore him and call back if he tried anything again. Later that day I called and asked if they went back to him and they said they did and talked to him and that it's all been reported. But it doesn't sound like they're actually going to do anything. It's near the end of the academic year and people's accommodation contracts will be expiring soon so I guess they're just going to let him leave when he's supposed to. I don't know if he moved course or was forced to quit and they just can't kick him out of accommodation or something. Hopefully nothing else happens, but if it does, I'll let you know. Before I begin, I'd like to state that I am a paranoid schizophrenic. This will come into play later. 
This happened recently on July 6th at around 8pm, just starting to get dark when I happened to notice a man walking around my housing complex. I saw this on my security system with about 6 cameras in total. He was wearing a black hoodie with the hood up and a pair of ratty blue jeans and he had a wild looking beard. I see him walking around and think nothing of it until around 30 minutes later I see the man walk around near my house and notice him walking a bit too close to my car for comfort. He then just walks away and I don't see him for another hour when I get an alert on my monitor with all of my security cameras that says there is a proximity alarm. I have each camera set to a different proximity alert and the two garage cameras were set to around 15 feet away from the camera. At this point it's dark outside and the cameras switch into infrared mode where I can get a better look at this guy. He looked crazed and had a small grin on his face. It didn't look too obvious but it was definitely noticeable. I kid you not, what he does next is downright terrifying. He looks up and then begins to stare into the camera with his wild looking face and just sits there for a good 5 minutes. He then tries the rear left door and fails to open it, then tries the driver's side door to no avail. The crazed man begins to then knock on the window of the driver's side door and starts pounding on it after a short period of time. This guy was getting more visibly agitated and angry with every second he couldn't get into my vehicle. By this point, I'm already on the phone with the police and they say they'll be at my place soon. I get off the phone with the operator and just continue to watch what this guy is doing. He's still trying to get into my vehicle and then stops and just stares into my car with no regard to anything else. After 10 minutes, two police cruisers come onto my street with their lights on and their guns drawn at the man. He looks at them and then starts walking toward them slowly. By doing that, the guy got tased. I assume the guy had a gun or some sort of weapon on him because why else would four officers have their weapons drawn? Then... I could hear a loud scream come from outside. One of the officers got the guy in cuffs and he turned his head back toward the main garage door camera, stares into it with the most deranged and insane look on his face. I gave the police a statement and a USB drive with all of the footage of what had just transpired and I'm still waiting to hear back from the police. I am not allowed to show any footage from these events as there is still an active investigation going on. In conclusion... Thanks, Brain, for making me paranoid and installing security cameras, and to the insane man who tried to break into my car. I hope I never see that creepy face again. I'm 54 years old now. As a teenager, I lived in a small town in central Virginia. Our town had less than 2,000 people. I was 17 in 1983 and one of my best friends, Chris, lived across the street from a peculiar house. When I first moved to the town in 1980, a family lived in the house and their daughter had been friends with Chris. Her name was Joy. Joy told Chris that every member of her family had seen ghosts in their house. I'm not sure if anyone believed them, but one night the whole family piled into the family car, took off to a motel and never returned to the house. It was assumed that this was a reaction to another supposed ghost encounter. I moved to town and became friends with Chris the same year Joy's family took off. I never really knew them, so all of that previous information was second-hand to me through Chris. Joy's old house remained empty. By empty, I mean no one bought the place. Actually, the house still contained most of the furniture and a lot of the family's belongings. They had literally grabbed what they could carry and left. Chris and I and our other friends liked to poke around in the house to see what we could find. Over the years, kids had thrown rocks and broken every window in the house. Every square inch of the floor upstairs, downstairs, and on the stairway was covered in broken glass. Like most houses in our town, there was little to no carpet inside, just bare wood flooring. One day in October 1983, Chris and I decided to skip school. We did this way too often. It's not like getting a real day off because we had stayed out of sight. Our small town was full of nosy people who would turn you in for skipping. In such a small town, most people knew your parents. This day, Chris and I decided to hide upstairs at Joy's old house. There were still beds and furniture upstairs and we carefully sneaked in and plopped down upstairs to read, talk, and nap the day away. Early in the afternoon, we suddenly heard footsteps downstairs. 
heavy footsteps that crushed the broken glass with each step. We immediately thought someone had heard or seen us through a window and was coming to bust us. This old house had vents built into the floor so that heat from the downstairs would float up through the vent to upstairs. The houses in that part of Virginia were built in the early 1900s and a lot of the houses in the area had these vents. They were basically just an ornate grill covering a large hole in the floor about a foot square in size. As we heard the footsteps crushing glass directly below us in what used to be the living room, we carefully peeked through the vent to try and see who was downstairs. With the footsteps directly below us, we could see no one downstairs. Then, suddenly, the footsteps were upstairs at the top of the staircase, right outside the door. Chris and I whispered quickly that we would fling the door open, act surprised and act like we were just passing by when we thought we heard kids in the house, so we came in to investigate. So we walked to the door of the bedroom. The footsteps had walked right up to the door and stopped. We opened the door and there was no one there. Chris and I stood silently looking at each other confused. After a moment we began searching the house, the entire house. No matter what room I was in while searching, I could hear Chris in another part of the house because the crushing of glass was so loud. Finally, Chris went outside and completely circled the exterior of the house. From the inside, I could hear him circling the outside because the house was surrounded on all sides by trees and there was a thick blanket of crunchy dry leaves all around. With no windows intact, it was easy to hear the crunching leaves from anywhere inside. We both had heard the same thing. The footsteps were heavy and made by something with two legs that sounded like standard human walking. Whatever it was had enough weight to crush glass underfoot. After the fact, we realized we had never heard the footsteps upstairs. They went directly below us to right outside the upstairs door. The house was completely empty, but we would have heard someone approaching or leaving the house because of the dry leaves. Neither of us believed in ghosts. We won't say what we experienced was a ghost. What we will say is that in all these years, neither of us have been able to come up with any other logical explanation. I'm still in contact with Chris thanks to social media, although we haven't been face to face in 33 years. After such a long time, you can begin to doubt older memories. You can wonder if you are mentally embellishing these things. Chris and I have not shared this story with many people. They would tend to think that we were lying or imagining things. When I told my wife this story a few years ago, I contacted Chris and asked him to give his version of these events. I only asked, what do you remember that day we skipped school at Joy's house? His story was identical to mine, to my relief. Joy's house was demolished in 1984. Today, the wooded area around it has grown so much, there's no sign a house was ever there. I'm a 25-year-old female, and for as long as I can remember, I have always been terrified of the dark. So to be able to fall asleep, I have to have some sort of dim light illuminating my bedroom, like a nightlight or the television. Now that there's some backstory, here's the first part of my story. This event occurred when I was around the age of 7 or 8. My best friend at the time, we'll call her April, was spending the night at my house. She was sleeping in my bed with me and told me the morning after that she had awoken in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. But when she turned over to get out of bed, she noticed something. There was this black, humanoid mass pouring out of the ceiling over my sleeping form, its face a mere inch away from my face. April had described it as this weird, bubbling black smoke. I was angry and asked her why she didn't wake me up. She replied that she was just too scared, and when she had seen it, she couldn't move out of fright and just shut her eyes trying to go back to sleep. Honestly, I can't really blame her. I'll skip forward to a few years back. I had completely forgotten about that incident when I was a child. My best friend, whom I've known since junior high, we'll call her Kyrie, and I were reminiscing about our teenage years. She had brought up a time when we were about 15. She was staying the night in my house. We were sleeping in my living room, her on one couch and me on the other on the opposite side of the room. The only light that was on was the stove light in the kitchen adjacent to my living room, 
so you can pretty much make out everything, albeit with a little difficulty. Kyrie had relayed to me that she was awake for a few hours after I had drifted off to sleep since my house had always freaked her out. At some point during the night, she rolled over to face my side of the room and almost peed herself at what she had seen. There was a pitch black humanoid figure hunched over my face. It was standing at the end of the couch and seemed to be just staring at me, only inches away from my face. She had said it was huge. It would have been as tall as the ceiling if it had stood up straight. Kyrie meekly told me that she had just simply turned back over and tried to forget about the terrifying figure looming over me, hoping she had simply imagined it. I instantly remembered the experience I had with April in my childhood and told her of it. Keep in mind that Kyrie and April had only spoken to each other a handful of times and were never at all close. So, how they had seen the exact same thing ten years apart, I will probably never know. I still think about this coincidence every now and then and I truly hope that whatever was watching me sleep is long gone. I must first tell you that I am now 18 and when these occurrences happened I was 12 or so. However, I remember every detail to this day. The setting of my story is at my grandfather's house in the year of 2014 and my main parental figure at the time was unfortunately my mother. She, my sister, and I have been borderline homeless and kept away from our father for the majority of our lives. However, my grandfather on my dad's side was our only suitable living option with whom my father stayed with when he was not working out of town. During our stay, which only lasted a couple of months, I was going through a very dark period of time. I was depressed and stressed about things that no child should be stressed over. I had no one and in response to these very mentally damaging emotions and thoughts, I decided to reach out to someone whom I've never even gotten the chance to meet, my father's mother. She had died due to a heart attack that was the result of taking too many gas station caffeine pills. She was addicted to them. My father and aunt both watched her die. She had lied down after arguing with my grandfather and didn't feel so well. When the pain got worse, she woke up and called for help. She had died before the ambulance could arrive. My older brother was not even born yet when she passed. I've only heard stories of her from time to time and always craved to know more about her. I think that goes with any relative that you never got to meet or that died at a young age to where you can't remember them. I would talk to her every day and every chance that I had just telling her about my day and asking about hers. I didn't have such a clear stance on if ghosts were real or not at this time, but I just needed someone and for some reason I chose her. I've always been very closed up, but I felt her presence or at least I manifested it. I would cry to her and silently scream on my really bad days. I would always leave my room after doing such with this extreme questioning. I questioned whether she was even there listening to me. She helped me regardless and at the time, I was okay with pretending that she was there for me. During these talks, I would also beg my grandmother to show herself to me, that she could trust me. This went on for months. I was basically granting the other side access to feed off of me, which is why this experience haunts me and leaves me questioning if it was even her. All I wanted was to see her. One night during our temporary stay, my sister and I were extremely hot in our tiny room that we both shared with which was only occupied with a single twin bed, a dresser, a bookshelf, and a lamp. My sister and I were so exhausted with having to take turns on who would sleep in the bed and who would sleep on the floor. I always had to sleep on the floor, but it was a worthy sacrifice. It meant that she could sleep comfortably. We decided that we were going to sneak into our aunt's room and be rebellious along with comfortable sleeping benefits. Now, the way that this house is set up is that there are three bedrooms and one bathroom in the hallway on the left side of the house. The hallway connects to the living room which leads into the kitchen. There is a separate doorway with a door that leads to the laundry room, garage, and a flight of stairs that leads to the only upstairs bedroom isolated from the rest of the house. This upstairs bedroom was my aunt's room. My sister and I, giggling and scared that we would get caught and or wake up my aunt, quickly walked through the dark house. My young sister led the way. As we got to the flight of stairs, I got this eerie feeling, but it didn't last long. I just brushed it off as me being scared of the dark in general. 
As she entered the room, I stopped at the very top stair. The entire room was pitch black. I couldn't see anything and I had lost my sister. The only thing I could hear was my aunt's very loud box fan whirring throughout the room. I started to panic as I called out for my sister's name at least three times. I was trying my best to feel around the back of the bedroom door to see if she was there because I couldn't see where I was and didn't want to wake my aunt up by tripping over something while sneaking into her bedroom in the middle of the night. That's when my hearing went out. I don't know the term, but my ability to hear slowly muffled and all there was was silence. Something told me to turn around. I don't know what, but something did, and this is when I really felt like a small 12-year-old child. There before me, when either the third or fourth step was who I assume was my grandmother. She was so tall. She seemed so, so tall. She was the darkest shade of black I had ever seen. The room without her was already pitch black to where I couldn't see anything. I could see her perfectly, though. The only detail I could make out of her figure was what seemed to be the end of a nightgown of hers that I actually have and wear sometimes, and some of her hair strands were individual and flowed around her figure. Imagine the character from the movie, Mama, except just a silhouette with long hair and some strands sticking out and flowing. That's what she looked like. She looked young. She just stood there looking at me. Granted, I couldn't see any facial features, but she was clearly there for me to see. I felt caught off guard at first, and then at peace. I can't explain the peace I felt just looking up at her. I imagine most people would be traumatized, and I was definitely kept in place, but I did not feel danger at the time. I was also confused. I just stared at her, taking her in. While still unable to hear, I went towards the black tall figure that I thought was my grandmother and actually reached for her hand and tried to take her with me. My mind was saying that it was her while also thinking it was my aunt because they look so similar in present day comparatively speaking. I also called her by my sister's name while trying to take her with me, but when I reached for her arm she disappeared into thin air. I'm glad I didn't fall down the stairs. I was so shocked that she wasn't coming along and I was also hurt. I snapped out of whatever zone I was in. My ability to hear came back the same way it left, muffled and then progressively got clearer until the fan was loud again. At that exact moment, my sister grabbed my wrist and said almost in a frustrated tone, Come on, Ansley, what are you doing? I went to bed that night wondering what had just happened. Months later, I was telling the story to my aunt, and she mentioned to me that the month in which this occurred was also the month that my grandmother had died. I've also asked myself whether or not my mind simply made the figure up to fulfill my request of seeing her, but I wasn't even focused on her during this time. In fact, I had stopped talking to her for weeks, maybe a month or so, because it no longer helped me. It wasn't until years later did I find out that spirits and even demons will take the form of who you were calling to to feed off of you and inflict pain or harm, to manipulate you. Me calling out to who I thought was my grandmother was basically leaving a door wide open for the other side, and I do believe that evil could have taken the figure of her. The only reason I'm torn is because this figure not once tried to harm me, just simply observed me and disappeared. My grandfather's ex-girlfriends have also reported seeing my grandmother and believing her to be my aunt only for her to disappear once they flipped the light switch on. I love to hear theories of what this could have been. I still believe that it was her, but a part of me is still terrified that it wasn't her. I've since moved a ton, but am currently still in this house as we speak. My grandfather moved out, and my aunt took over the house with her wife. Recently, we've all been seeing figures and shadows swoosh past doorways, mainly the doorway to the laundry room that includes those same flight of stairs. A small child of a family friend went to use the bathroom and saw what he described to be someone standing at that doorway to the laundry room and came outside crying. My aunt's wife said she saw it too, but I don't think it was my grandmother this time. I must also inform you that the owner of the house had a son who passed away due to a four-wheeler accident. He didn't die in the house itself, but that upstairs bedroom was his and 
still to this day has some of his belongings, including four-wheeler trophies, Hot Wheels collections, etc., in the crawl spaces. I don't know what to make of all of it, but I'm just glad that I haven't died yet. Throughout my life, my family and I had odd experiences happen in a few of several homes that we lived in, so we were no strangers to paranormal activity. My mom has always believed that whatever spirits or energy we encountered were brought by negativity or traumatic events that may have happened in the homes previously. My parents had saved up enough money to buy a nice four-bedroom, three-bathroom home with far too much space for us to live in and it was fairly new being less than a decade old. I was in elementary school transitioning into middle school at this time. Three-fourths of the bedroom were upstairs, so naturally my parents took the master, my older brother took the room with a window facing the neighborhood, and I took the room in the middle. I loved the house. It had been mine and my mother's dream to move into a two-story home with lots of space to accommodate for our needs and wants, and I think the four of us went in with high expectations and a lot to look forward to. During the first month of us moving in, my mom had her first experience. She was staying at home alone and was washing dishes when an odd feeling of someone being there had overcome her. She initially ignored it until she felt the back of her hair bounce up and down against her shoulders like someone playing with her ponytail. She turned around. Nothing. She knew it couldn't have been a draft, but she also knew it was the best to ignore it. So she did and continued washing the dishes. However, it only took a few seconds for it to begin again. This time the bounces were more enthusiastic, and the moment my mom rushed to look behind her, it had stopped again suddenly. My mom was a very impatient and stubborn woman, and she was never the type to let herself be scared so easily, but, but at that point she realized that there was something in our home that could make physical contact with her, then it could easily do the same to my brother and I. So my mom took a defensive approach and called out, If you mean no harm to my family, then you may stay. But if you are here to hurt or scare my family, then you need to get out of my house. You are not welcome here. And then nothing happened. The odd feeling slowly went away, and my mom went back to doing her thing without any odd occurrences disrupting her again. In fact, that seemed to be the only time that anyone had an experience, for the time being at least. Fast forward to about five months into our time living there, my family was going through a hard time. My older brother was getting into trouble at school and he was distancing himself more from us. My parents were arguing a lot more and I was getting bullied at middle school while dealing with my self-consciousness due to being overweight. All the space in the house felt too much by then. We had no more than a large table and a Christmas tree in our living room. We rarely had guests and the house always felt chilly so it felt more lonely than ever. Sometimes I would lie awake at night and stare at nothing until I fell asleep, thinking of everything that was bothering me and missing the way life used to be, missing the way we were as a family before we had moved. One night I woke up and just stared into the space outside of my door which was cracked open. The lights were off and while I'm usually afraid of the dark, I was for some reason transfixed on the space outside my open door that showed the hallway. I stared not thinking of anything, slowly zoning out until my eyes blurred. I stared, not a bad feeling in my mind or body, nothing but the pull of something that kept my gaze. All of a sudden the lights in the hallway came on, and I saw my brother rush to my mom's room. I blinked for what felt like the first time since I had woken up. I became aware of myself again, of how dark it had been in my room which I was always afraid of. I sat up in bed, confused and thankful that I had been snapped out of whatever sort of trance I was in. I could hear my mom talking with my brother, but couldn't make out what it was. But I didn't need to try, as moments later my brother opened my door and said, Did you hear that? I was confused and I replied, No, hear what? Instead of answering me, he went back to my mom's room and after more talking, my mom came with him. You really didn't hear anything? Were you awake? My brother asked me. You're going to scare her, we'll talk about it tomorrow, my mom said to my brother, and then she asked if I wanted to sleep with her and my dad that night, and being a little freaked out, naturally I went with her that night. 
It wasn't until the following morning that my mom and brother had explained what had happened. They explained how while both of them were in their rooms awake, they heard what sounded like a woman calling something out in the hallway. My brother knew it couldn't have been my mom because it wasn't her voice. But when he went to ask her anyway if it was her, my mom said she heard it too and that it sounded too old to be me. What was weirder so was how neither of them could understand what she was saying, and what was even more odd was that while my room was right in the middle of the hall with the door open, I heard absolutely nothing. All I could think of was the odd feeling while I stared out into the hallway that night. Two months later, and unfortunately, things had escalated to the point of no return with my family. My mom was divorcing my dad after discovering his other family in his hometown back in Mexico. My brother understood the circumstances when she told us that we had to move away, but growing up being blind to the signs, I was distraught and caught completely by surprise. My mom did her best to stay strong in front of us, but she was bitter and torn up inside. I'd stay with my dad a few times over the weekend, but when I'd see the state of the home with even more open space, it just felt lonely. I stopped visiting, and my dad and I decided it was best to just spend time together during the day. In no time, with my mom supporting us in a separate home, and no one to help my dad pay for the house, we lost it, and my dad moved out in a moment's notice. Our happy family home had become the place of our family's end. One day, not too long after he moved out, I asked my dad what it was like living there alone without us. When he told me it was scary, I was curious about his answer and asked why. What he said terrified me. He said that some nights he would feel like he was being watched or followed throughout the house. He'd feel so nervous that he would practically run to the room and he'd rarely stay anywhere else in the house because of it. One night he was jolted awake from what he knows was a vivid and horrible nightmare, but before he even had a second to breathe and gather his thoughts, he felt the bed slam against the floor and all the doors room door, closet doors, and bathroom door opened and slammed shut all at once. He didn't remember his nightmare, and from that night on he slept with the lights on. I was horrified when he told me this. Was his bed floating? It was winter when this had happened, so no windows were open, and even if they were, no draft could have opened and closed the doors the way it did when I thought about it. That day, when I went home, I relayed the experience to my mom, she seemed surprised, but she laughed. When she saw how confused I was, she said, Before we left the house, I told your father he was going to see something in that house for everything he put our family through. He laughed it off. I guess he won't be laughing about it anymore. To this day, I wonder if my mom's first experience and her message to my dad were connected. She wanted whatever was there to leave her family alone and to leave her home if it meant any harm. Could her leaving that home in my dad's experience be because his actions had hurt our family? Could my mom have sealed the deal with her statement toward my dad? Or could it have just waited for the moment when the negative energy was highest in that house? Whatever the cause, I think there is power in words that are said with full intent. It's a scary concept to think about it. While I was a teenager, I babysat at least for three families. There was a fourth, but this is why I drew the line. This was around 1994 to 1995. Now the fourth family had two kids between 6 to 11. I was a bit annoyed because the 11-year-old boy acts like he was 6 and the 6-year-old boy acts like he was 10. So there was some kind of issue mentally with this older boy. I was carrying a book with me for research called Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. This will come up later. Now, I'm not going to say that the night went off without a hitch, but oh boy. Now I put my things in the closet beside the front door, and this will be important. We went to the park, which was right next to the apartment complex of which they lived in. The 11-year-old absolutely refused to come back with me until dark, which for me is a big no. I told him he wouldn't get one story out of me until we came home. We got back. 7 p.m. and I made them their evening snack and the 11-year-old grabs my book bag and pulls out the book. I am stunned and startled when he demands that I read him those stories. I have the rule about scary stories and I told him no, we would read the book that his mother selected. 
He whines that he wants to read these stories from my book. I am just freaked because I had left my book bag in the closet next to the door and he told me he found it on the couch. I had no memory of ever leaving my books out for anyone. I suddenly see my homework and books all spread out on the couch. I hear something coming from one of the rooms and I just grab the boys and tell them that we are going out. We go to their grandparents who are on the top floor of the apartments. Well there I saw that once again the 11 year old boy is clutching my book of scary stories demanding I read from it. I'm just staring at him wondering what I should say. Grandma looks at me and then the book asking where the heck I got it. Again, this is my book I was doing for a project for in my American literature class. She tells me that scary stories that tell in the dark is haunted and to get rid of the book. I push the book into a jacket pocket. Yeah, it fit there, and I told the woman I won't read it, and now isn't the time to demand I trash the book. Cops arrive, and sure enough, a neighbor broke in and was in the middle of ransacking the apartment when we got back from the park. I noticed that we had avoided something terrible because the cops had arrived. And sure enough, a neighbor broke in and was in the middle of ransacking the apartment when we got back from the park. I never requested payment for my time and refused to babysit for that family again. I never told my parents and I also tried to push it out of my mind. One question was, why did this guy choose to go through my backpack and not anyone else's bags? He had ample time to do so, but he chose a broke teenager's backpack. I recently got a new job working at a hemp farm in Kentucky. The work was tedious. My co-workers and I would spend eight to nine hours every day in a barn. On busy days, we would work until dark, cutting plants and sticking them in trays. Although listening to music took my mind off of work, I found that listening to a podcast made me feel even more productive. It was at the time I discovered the Let's Read podcast on Reddit. As I spent many days listening to stranger stories, I began to think about if I had any paranormal or scary experiences of my own. Digging deep in my brain, I recalled, I recalled the most memorable experience I have had in terms of horror stories. I've never shared this story with anyone in fear of them not believing me or calling me crazy. But I have a feeling that someone out there may enjoy it. Here it goes. I was around 12 or 13 years old at the time this happened, in the 7th or 8th grade. Since it was summer break, I had fallen into a terrible habit of staying up until 3 or 4 in the morning and sleeping well into the afternoon. My favorite thing to do was lay in bed late at night and watch YouTube videos, play games on my phone, or read a good book. On this particular night, it was around 3.30 a.m. I remember the time because I saw the clock hit 3.33 a.m., a time that had always scared me as a kid. Before I dive into the spooky stuff, let me explain how I saw what I saw. My house is on a corner lot in a large residential area. My bedroom is on the second floor of our two-story house. Across from the house on the other side of the street is a pretty good sized patch of forest. The street light in front of my house was a little wonky and I often would go out at night leaving my street dark. My stepdad didn't like the house being completely dark at night so he had some lights installed in the front yard that lit up the front of the house. If I had my blinds open, the lights would shine through the tops of my curtains into my room. This will explain how I was able to see through the window later in the story. I was watching YouTube videos in bed with my laptop sitting on my chest. I started to feel tired, so I powered off the computer and plugged my phone up to the charger beside me. Just before I turned over to sleep, I noticed that my curtains were not all the way closed. There was a small part in the middle, maybe about three inches wide. Being paranoid, I rolled out of bed and turned on my lamp so I could see to close the curtains. 
I closed the gap between them, and all was well. I turned off my lamp and crawled into bed, slowly drifting off to sleep. I remember being very close to falling asleep when I heard a familiar sound from behind me, the sound of my curtains being pulled across the rod. I jolted awake, my eyes opening wide. I dared not to move, for what I was afraid, there was something or someone behind me. After a good two to three minutes of silence, I gathered all of my courage to roll over and look at the window. Sure enough, the gap in my curtains was back. It was 100% positive that I had closed them. This shook me to my core as I had been watching a good amount of horror movies with my family recently. It didn't make sense as to how they opened again. I would have heard the door to my room open if someone had come in and everyone in my house was asleep. Something wasn't adding up. Again, I rolled out of bed, but this time I did not go near the window, for I was too shaken up. I walked around my bed to the other side and sat down against my closet doors, the window out of view. I leaned across my bookshelf and began to think logically about what could have happened. Perhaps there was a draft in the air conditioning kicking on, or maybe I had been too groggy to notice I didn't close the curtains all the way. Even though I thought about it for a while, none of it made sense. My curtains are the heavy black light kind, and it would take more than a little bit of air to move them, and I was completely positive I had shut them. After a few minutes had passed, I turned some music on low volume on my phone to take my mind off of what had just happened. It was then I brushed it off and stood up to go back to bed when I saw it. A single eye peering through the gap in my curtains. I saw the white of the eye clearly as the lights outside of my house were reflecting off of it. There was no colored iris. It was all black. I just stood there, frozen in fear as I watched the eyes dart around my room until it met mine. The look in it was crazed, terrifying, and even hungry. I then noticed a pale face with flaky skin and wispy strands of black hair surrounding the eye. I blinked, expecting it to go away, but it didn't move. I'm not sure how long I stood there, but it felt like hours. It was only when I started to quietly sob in which it disappeared out of the air. I don't have any idea how I saw what I saw. Like I mentioned before, my bedroom is on the second story, pretty high up. A person would have needed a very tall ladder to reach my window. Not to mention my window is locked with a screen on the inside as well. It was well past 4am by now, and my neighborhood is not notorious for criminal activity, as many cops live in the area. If anyone has any idea of what I could have seen, Please don't hesitate to reach out. I would love some answers, as I have never had any experience quite like this. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, wait, what was I supposed to say? Fuck.